move to the motion before the House tonight, which is this House has no confidence in Modi's government. And I look to Chaitanya Kedial, the Chief of Staff at the Oxford Union, to open the case for the proposition. Good evening and welcome to this historic debate at the Oxford Union. I want to begin by thanking you, Madam President, for having the courage to organize a debate that is refreshing and that is unique in its content. For the first time in this union's history, despite a century-long tradition of always discussing confidence in Her Majesty's government, we have the unique opportunity to discuss confidence in a different government. This is a bold step that recognizes that the Oxford Union isn't a British institution. Rather, it is an institution composed entirely of its members, the people who've taken the time out to come and watch this debate. And therefore, when we vote today, we aren't voting as armchair elites from the UK. We aren't voting as Indians who somewhat know what's happening in the subcontinent. But rather, we're voting proudly as members of this union, choosing proudly that we have no confidence in a government that we cannot have faith in. Before I begin, I'm going to acknowledge that some of you might not be or have not been a citizen of India for the last 20 years like me. Some of you might be confused at who is this Modi? I've heard about him in the news. I think I know it's the one in India, right? That's the country with the peninsula. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do before I begin into a really serious discussion on why we should have no confidence is do a quick recap. Civics 101, as it were. India is a huge country. This is something you probably already know. We have an election that's currently going on, the results of which come out in less than a week. There are 900 million voters. That is 30, oh, I study law, guys, can't do the math, but that's probably 20 times the population of the United Kingdom. It is the largest democratic exercise in any event that is taking place. In the center of this government, we have Narendra Modi, who came into power with a historic landslide in 2014, on the backs of getting jobs, getting infrastructure, getting progress. All that we have seen is a growth, a growth of intolerance, a country that is now more divided than it has ever been. And with that, I'm gonna give you a brief framework of how I go in this debate. Ironically, for challenging a Hindutva government, I have a three-pronged argument based on the three principal Hindu gods. First, we have Shiva, the destroyer. And I'll tell you how Modi has also destroyed institutions of extreme significance in our country. Second, we have Vishnu, the preserver. And I'll tell you how he has preserved the worst elements in our society, emboldening them to heights that we should not be proud of. But finally, and coming to the main god of them all, Brahma, I will tell you how he has created a hatred, a divisiveness, and a failed vision for what it means to be an Indian. And it's on these three grounds that I'm gonna be incredibly proud to propose this debate. But before that, I'll have a little bit of fun and I'll be like Modi and insult my opponents and give them no opportunity to reply back <laughs> to me. Our first speaker today is Mr. Elliot Edward Bromley, the chair of the consultative committee from St. Edmund Hall, as he reminds us every Monday. <laughs> I have been informed that when he's not at the union, he's actually masquerading as a second year MPhil candidate in modern South Asian studies. The last time I saw Elliot speak from these very dispatch boxes, it was on a motion about Margaret Thatcher and being whether Margaret Thatcher was a working class hero. I see that he has not heeded the serious critique that he received on YouTube when he was told that a yuppie twat who cannot relate to the middle or working class should not be standing on this podium. But now we see Elliot standing proudly endeavoring to relate to 1.3 billion Indians and all of these individuals that he's gonna so proudly represent. All jokes aside, under Modi's India, Elliot is probably more Indian than I am. With the glares he gives me every time I cut into a steak, Elliot would be a perfect fit into the Hindu, Hindutva Sang Pariwar. Our second speaker in the opposition is Nuri Abbas, a first year history and politics student at New College and the international officer on the Oxford Union's Access Committee. When I first heard that Nuri was going to support the Modi government, I was surprised. How is it that a proud Pakistani was going to defend the man who recently declared that India's nuclear arsenal is not kept just for Diwali? <laughs> but as I know, when I see that portrait of Benazir Bhutto right there, 
this union's political opportunism runs deep among its committee members. <laughs> getting, us, getting us to channel whatever strings we can pull as long as we get to stand on these dispatch boxes and have the center stage. <laughs> Third, we have Janvi Dadrakar, a British Indian financial consultant and CEO of Moira Consulting. Ms. Dadrakar serves as the director of the Europe India Forum. After a quick Google search, I found some amazing insights about her. Ms. Dadrakar, I can confirm to you that your company, the Europe India Forum's marketing, has been a huge success, with the first three links that come when you Google it not being its website, not being its social media presence, or any news articles, but the UK company house. But more pertinently, I know that she knows how to attract an audience. Her latest address on YouTube at the Future Talent Conference has already garnered 50 entire views <laughs> when I last checked. I am eager to see how your speech is going to one-up that performance tonight. <laughs> Our last, and I won't keep you for too long, speaker today is Mr. Gurcharan Das, an author, commentator, and the former CEO of Procter & Gamble India. He has written the international bestseller, India Unbound. While organizing the logistics of this debate, I had an amazing set of correspondence with Mr. Das, with email subjects such as falling out of love with Modi, and let's really talk about this. Mr. Das, I'm very glad that you're still sitting on the opposition bench. <laughs> But much like Prime Minister Modi, I am being unfair to you by taking this opportunity to control the narrative about why you're sitting on that bench and not giving you an ample opportunity to reply. Madam President, these are your guests, and they're incredibly welcome. As I now begin my eight-minute speech, let me get to your attention what is really at stake here. Because it's very easy to dismiss this as a bunch of armchair liberal elites, which I'm sure we're going to get on YouTube anyway, having a conversation without recognizing anything. And so I want to take a moment to actually recognize this debate isn't about people like me. I and many in privileged individuals who've had the opportunity to study at a university like Oxford will survive and prosper regardless, or not prosper, but survive <laughs> regardless of the government. But it, this debate is about the millions, almost the billion individuals who don't have these accesses to power, who don't have these halls and bastions of free speech to voice themselves in. These are individuals who work in the lowest forms of employment, manual scavengers, farmers who continue to live in distress. So when we decide whether or not we have confidence in this government, you need to remember that these are the individuals on whom you're making a decision. It is for these individuals and their life that you're casting your vote. But what does that mean then, right? Let us start, as I said, with the destruction that has been created under this government. Because let us recognize that India has prospered for the last 70 years as a fairly democratic country in a region that has seen huge degrees of instability. We have been proud of our institutions. We have Mr. Prashant Bhushan, whose father instituted the case against Mrs. Gandhi when she tried to declare emergency. We have a robust system, but this government has tackled and harmed and tried every opportunity that they can get to challenge these independent institutions. Whether it's a judiciary that we can no longer take complete confidence in because of who is in charge. Whether it is a planning commission that has been renamed into Niti Aayog, which publishes statistics that could only come out of a storybook four months before elections, making India seem all of a sudden like 1967 China with figures that no global investor can trust, this government has tried hard to destroy these institutions of independence. From an election commission that we are now worried doesn't have teeth sharp enough to bite into the BJP government, it is an important factor to remember that regardless of any political policies, social policies, economic policies, if this government is irreversibly damaging what it means to be Indian and what it means to have Indian institutions, that is already a government you cannot have confidence in because you have created irreversible harms that will last you not only this lifetime, but future lifetimes in a way that can't be calculated. But then secondly, on destruction. There's been a destruction of what it means to be an Indian. Because for a very long time, and I'm sure all the people who studied class 10 civics will nod along, we were taught at the starting point of India after the British, like these individuals did all that they did to our country, was all the preamble and a constitution. We, the people of India, solemnly declare to, resolve, to create a so sovereign socialist democratic republic. That was the conception with which we began. And yes, there were amendments that brought in, but we had a common playing ground. This was what it meant to be Indian. That narrative is now being destroyed. 
We are speakers who say, if you want to be acceptable in Indian discourse, you need to acknowledge your Hindu identity. You need to acknowledge that if you're not Hindu, at least your ancestors were Hindu. This has never been a reality of the country of India. This might be a reality of some kingdoms in this country that is now called India, but to claim that this is what it means to be Indian is a destruction of that identity. But this is just on destruction. This is just the high level political damage that this government has already constru construed on our, government, on our country. Let's move to the preservation. What are these issues and what are these pernicious problems that they've maintained and in short continue? This looks like a classist system where there isn't a real opportunity to break out. When individuals such as myself still think we are upper middle class, India is continuing to remain in a system where we claim, yes, let's remain pro-business, but hasn't actually acknowledged the deepest inequalities that have not only existed, but become far worse. We have not only seen unemployment rate not rise, but actually decline under this government. They have preserved the kinds of toxicity that ensures individuals don't actually have a free and a fair chance to escape the poverty that they're condemned to. But more than just preserving, I think it's important, and this is the main thrust, the creation. Because if I can show you that regardless of what this government did, if the things it tried to bring into power, if the creative elements of this government are problematic and those that we can't have confidence in, then I think this debate clearly falls in the proposition. I'll have three strands on that. The first strand is on the economy. This is a government which doesn't believe in accountability and checks. That is why you can have a prime minister who suddenly gets up on November 8th, 2016, and decides that merely 89% of this entire country's currency is now void. There is no checks, there's no questioning of the internal system. And here's the issue. You might say, well, they might have poor economic policy, at least, the, at least journalists, at least other individuals will hold them account. But that fails as well, right? Because you have a prime minister who in five years has had zero press conferences with a truly independent and free media sources. You have a government that cannot be held accountable because they are unwilling to do so. And when they are pushed, when they are asked, why have you made the choices you've made? They make excuses. They build a layer and a filter of excuses. Let's look at demonetization, something that no minister has adequately answered in the last three years. They first told you it's to get rid of terrorism funding. That was proven to not be true. They then tell, told us, oh, it's got to get rid of all the illicit black money. All of that continued to persist. They then said, India, a country where the vast majority still don't genuinely have a digital connection, should transition like the US and the UK into an e-currency, an e-system based thing. The only e that they could get is on a report card for how poorly <laughs> they have treated this economy. The second creation of theirs then that needs to be hung, drawn and quartered here, is the divisiveness that not only they preserved, but that they have festered. This looks like union ministers garlanding individuals who are allegedly committing lynching of in people for eating substances like beef that I can laugh about here. It is not a laughing matter back in India. When people are knocking down on your doors, when people are not even being published, but rather applauded for this vigilantism to reconstruct this identity of Hinduism, you see a creation that is not only being condoned, but is actually being perpetuated by them. But the last and final creation that is the most pernicious of them all is this broad idea of Hinduism and Hindutva that I've been talking. Because make no mistake, across the bench, you will find many people here who are proudly Hindu. But to be proudly Hindu meant something very different than what it means today. Hinduism that the BJP government imposes is a very myopic, political agenda dominated by North Indian Brahmins and subjugated on individuals across this entire country. It is putting a certain political ideology above all else. But finally, and this is why this government can't just be defeated by me but by four entire speakers, is because they have a laundry list of problems. From linguistic suppression, from making sure that certain regions are disproportionately mistreated and not given the opportunities that they deserve. This government cannot have any confidence in. When you walk out of those historic doors, don't cast a vote as an individual living in these comfortable halls. But rather, think about whether, go whether a government that has permanently harmed political institutions, that has festered social division like never before, and that has created economic policies that is disastrous, can gain anyone's confidence. And I urge you to vote in the proposition. Thank you very much. <laughs>